I'd like to invite everyone to regain their seats. Si je pourrais demander à tout le monde de reprendre vos sièges. Welcome back, everyone. Re-bienvenue, tout le monde. Hello, everyone. So you'll have noticed that I have magically transformed from Jonathan Bingston into uh, Lise Brun. I'm a program officer with Carl. Bonjour, tout le monde. Je m'appelle Lise Brun. Je suis agente de projet avec la BRC, l'Association des bibliothèques de recherche du Canada. Et malheureusement, Jonathan a dû nous quitter. Alors, je vais prendre la relève pour l'après-midi. So I'll be assuming Jonathan's role for the afternoon. So you may remember that uh, a few months ago, we put out a call for lightning talks, and uh, we were very, very pleased uh, with the exciting range of submissions that we received. And so I'm certainly looking forward to hearing about all of them today. And I'd like to just go right ahead and invite Corey Davis here to moderate this session. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> That's what my notes say. I'm just following my notes here, folks. Uh, so thank you very much, Lise, and uh, for all your hard work uh, to make today happen. Uh, very much appreciated. Thank you. And for all of you uh, for coming back after lunch and joining us for our next session, which will be a, a series of lightning presentations that will um, sample current Canadian in initiatives in uh, digital preservation. Uh, we have a number of speakers, as you can see, uh, down the table here. Uh, they will each have five minutes to talk about uh, their particular initiative. Um, Susan uh, will very kindly keep time for us. And I will just ask, uh, when you hear the, the alarm bells ringing, um, if you could wrap up what you're saying within about 30 seconds. And if those adjacent to the speakers, because sometimes when you're speaking, you might not hear, just give them a little... <laughs> nudge like that and we'll do our best to get through this. This is really intended to give us a sense of some of the things that are going on. We're sort of zooming down here to the local level uh, and it's really just meant to stimulate some conversations around particular initiatives. So um, without uh, further ado, I will uh, introduce our first presenter. Uh, Sarah DuPont is Aboriginal Engagement Librarian at the University of British Columbia in lovely Vancouver, who will speak about her work on indigenization.ca and pragmatic audio preservation with Aboriginal peoples. I'll turn the mic over to you. Right. Thank you, Corey. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. My slides are up. Wonderful. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be on this panel. Um, as a Métis librarian, I'd like to begin by acknowledging being a visitor on the traditional unceded territory of the Ghanagahakwe uh, Mohawk people. 
and I would like to tell you on whose traditional territory I work in Vancouver. Um, this is the traditional unceded territory of the Musqueam people, otherwise known as Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. I really love putting this photo up to show you where we are because it's from the perspective of Musqueam. UBC is situated right there. <laughs> And um, we interact with Musqueam on a, a regular basis, and it's that relationship that's so important to providing a good, solid foundation to the work that we do. Specifically, I work at the Huihua Library, which, to our knowledge, is the only Aboriginal branch library at an academic institution in Canada. It's part of the First Nations Longhouse. And I also work at the Irving K. Barber Learning Centre, where the indigitization program is situated. So I'll tell you a little bit about the digitization grant part of the program really quickly, and then I'll move over to the preservation pieces um, in more depth. So the program is a partnership with Indigenous communities that offers a pathway to start doing digitization work on the terms of the First Nation. They invest up to $10,000, and the Irving K. Barber Learning Centre gives up to $10,000, and we work together to offer a pathway forward. It includes equipment, training that demystifies this work, and discussing ideas and suggestions for some of the larger information management decisions. These include culturally appropriate access policies and long-term storage. An important thing to mention here is that there is no requirement for these files to be made accessible to the general public. So this is uh, exceptionally uncommon for digitization grants, but it is the most important point that has made this program a success. So we don't have collections that we steward for these um, for these participants. Oh, I've lost some slides. Okay, they're just not there. Okay, so the impact to date: forty-four projects. Um, about eleven thousand audio cassettes have been digitized in the province of British Columbia, and just shy of four hundred thousand dollars in grant funding. So what happens during training week is everybody comes down. We usually have about six to eight projects that uh, are represented by one or two individuals. And we show people how to do this work during a training week at the Museum of Anthropology. Here's Jerry Lawson. He's the indigitization technical lead. And he's teaching us how to do everything from uh, working with those really difficult shells on audio cassettes that don't have screws and you have to crack them. Those ones are tough. Uh, to how to organize the digital files. Oops. And we also teach people in, about environmental conditions and assessments and some basic special processing of damaged physical materials. So some of the challenges. Uh, these materials, analog media materials, are irreplaceable. They are usually the only copy and they have very important um, recordings of elders telling stories, traditional use stories, sometimes in First Nations languages, sometimes not, um, but always incredibly valuable content. Uh, trust is not always immediate towards academic, and I'm going to throw in government institutions as well. Um, there's no public access to the content. Uh, it's not possible because of this lack of trust. Until nations have time to decide what, if anything, can be made publicly accessible to whom and when. The urgency to make the content accessible to community leaders is incredibly important. So, for many reasons, this work is urgent, but the urgency of the degrading media is second to the urgency of the fact that elders and knowledge holders are leaving us. With limited resources, communities are pressed to make archival materials available now so that people can work with the content with the elders who are still with us. This is important to putting the pieces of the puzzle back together. The pieces of language puzzle, other traditional knowledges, putting those pieces together is incredibly time sensitive. The preservation of knowledge in Indigenous contexts um, is not the bits and bytes, but in releasing content from physical and digital forms to lived, spoken, remembered and practiced knowledge. Of course, funding is, uh, is a challenge, as we've heard a lot about today, so I'm not going to go into that because I think my timing is almost up. What we do is uh, focus on relationship building and pragmatic approaches that include storage and training, uh, including uh, embedding checksums, um, locks, some of the, the uh, processes that you've heard about today. And we're future, um, our future exploration will include 
Exploration of LTO in partnership with the Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Centre. Finally, words to leave you with, uh, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. If Indigenous nations ask you for your help, see what part of their tiered strategy for preservation you can meaningfully participate in. Maybe it's working to identify a strategy, maybe it's a storage agreement for hard drives, or maybe it's helping them identify a dam. Um, as Lisa stated this morning, we are stronger together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'd like to next introduce Lisa Goddard, a colleague of mine from the University of Victoria, Associate University Librarian for Digital Scholarship and Strategy at UVic, who will be speaking about the Endings Project, which relates to preservation of digital humanities works. Thank you, Lisa. Great, thanks. Uh, so with a slightly different hat on, I just wanna have uh, a chance to give you guys a quick overview of the Endings Project and what we're trying to achieve. So the Endings team um, consists of digital humanities professors from three different disciplines. We have humanities computing programmers and we have librarians on the team. So it's a nice kind of interdisciplinary team and it reflects kind of DH ways of working in general, I think. And our research questions are these. How do digital humanities projects conclude? And then how should digital humanities projects conclude? Mm -hmm. So, to answer the first question, we did a broad survey. We got about 127 responses from researchers who had been involved in digital humanities projects since like 1980, so quite a big range of folks. And um, then we did in-depth interviews with 27 of those project leads to understand more about what the challenges have been um, in preserving their projects. But really, the short answer to how do they conclude is that they kind of don't. Um, what we found is that um, only about 25% of our respondents have actually finished their DH project. And remembering that these span back to the 80s, we're talking about like almost 40 years worth of projects. Um, and only 25% of those have actually finished. So what we see is that in the digital world, it's just too easy to always continue. You could always do something more. You could always do something better. They weren't scoped well to start with. The scope creep was crazy. And the projects go on forever way after their funding cycles are over. So there's a real challenge just with knowing when to end it. Um, the other question we asked is, where is it archived? So of those people who have completed their projects, where have they archived them? Um, and we had 18 projects that sort of said, yeah, we're archived. But then when we dug in a bit and we're like, oh, where are you archived? They're like, at a URL on the internet. Um, so the kinds of places that they consider to be kind of archivally secure are not the sorts of things that we would consider to be archivally secure for sure. Um, and out of the interviews, we had uh, you know a number of themes, none of which I think will be a surprise to most people here. But I had a, I found it really fascinating to talk to these researchers about what the role of the library might be. And many of these folks did go to their libraries to ask for help at various in various decades. And a lot of them were told like we, we kind of want to help, but we don't really know how, or we don't really know if we have capacity, or we don't want to make a commitment. And I really feel like we. This, this is an opportunity for us to do something that researchers really want and need, and we need to kind of figure out how to say yes a little bit more to them, and I get how challenging that is. Um, hosting is one area that came up over and over as a huge challenge. Tons of people just lost their projects because they couldn't pay the host, or somebody changed institutions, and now they didn't have an institutional host anymore. Like, it was, there are some opportunities for libraries here, I think. To answer the question, how should these projects conclude, um, we're actually going to conclude some DH projects. So we committed to concluding four projects from UVic, and we're actually going to do probably more like seven projects, all of which are um, sort of in progress slash almost finished at UVic right now. The premise is that we're going to take these complex kind of queryable sites and turn them into giant static sites. That means that HTML, JavaScript, CSS are the only technologies you will need, browser-side technologies, to access these things well into the future. And we think that those open standards are likely to continue to be usable for a long time to come. It means that our server-side infrastructure is very, very minimal, and that's how it needs to be for the library to commit to this kind of thing. Um, we're also building diagnostic tools that help you track how close to finish your product project is, which won't necessarily do anything about the human problem, but at least you can kind of see what it is you have to do still. And it forces you to define what you mean by finished. 
from the beginning, which we found that an enormous number of researchers did not do. They didn't know what finished would look like when they started these projects at all. And many of them still don't, to be honest. And then finally, we just want to develop a set of kind of principles and guidelines and hopefully a kind of a compliance quiz so researchers can kind of answer a set of questions and see how close to preservable their project is at any given time. And hopefully you'd start doing this work quite early so you can make good choices from the beginning. And uh, yeah, so that's just a slide telling you a little bit about the outputs, but um, I would encourage you to follow our project and we'll probably talk more about it once we have some more firm results. So watch the space. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lisa. That was wonderful. Um, uh, our, our next speaker is uh, Karen McLeod, Manager, uh, publish, uh, Published Acquisitions at Library and Archives Canada with a pres uh, presentation entitled Digital Preservation Starts with Acquiring Digital Content. There we go. Uh, okay, Rob. Uh, so we've been talking uh, today a lot about, uh, of course, digital preservation, and I'm in a room full of experts, so I'm the first one to say this is not my area of expertise. I'm here to learn. But uh, in order to have anything to preserve, we one have to begin by acquiring and having the digital content. And that's where I uh, come in. I'm an acquisitions uh, librarian at Library and Archives Canada. And while we talked about the broad strategies and the many opportunities for collaboration that the digital preservation space um, affords us all, and um, being able to uh, it speaks, I think, to the library acquisitions teams to prompt us to evolve our collecting practices in order to prioritize digital content. The more we can bring in born digital content, the perhaps um, it will help our preservation colleagues down the road by working together up front. So this lightning talk, very briefly, is going to just uh, highlight three re recent initiatives that um, the acquisitions teams uh, within the Published Heritage Branch at LAC have undertaken. And these are really much, uh, very much our first steps for my team to um, get us on the road to more proactively enhancing our born digital acquisitions. So there we go. So, so quick word about drivers. Many of you, I'm sure, are uh, familiar with legal deposit legislation. It was expanded in um, 2007 to include digital publications, but changing the regs doesn't necessarily mean everything has been going tickety-boo. Um, there have been limitations in our own capacity and our technical infrastructure that have prevent prevented us from proactively and really systematically acquiring the digital content but we must acquire this content. Our collection practices need to align with the trends in the industry. And it's been quite clear that digital output in our creative industries has been increasing for many years. Um, and we have to uh, remember that these are our clients. These are the ones that are contributing to our national collection. And we need to make sure that we have our uh, collection practices in place to acquire the digital content that they're producing. But now we have our big opportunity. You heard my colleague Fabe earlier mention that we have a digital asset management system that is being tested at LEC, a suite of associated ingest tools, and a new library management system. So we really have opportunity ahead of us um, to prepare for big changes. And so with that change in mind, some of the small pilots that we ran over the last year to increase our own understanding and knowledge on the acquisition side of the preservation requirements uh, were this. So we did a digital news uh, ingest pilot. Uh, this involved us working with three newspaper publishers to explore digital news formats, the content coverage, the ingest options, what would work for them, what might work for us. We needed to compare before we're able to pass off digital content to our preservation colleagues to help us preserve. We needed to understand how the replica edition compares to the print edition. What kind of overlaps are there? The insights that we gained really help us refine what it is we want to collect, what we need to focus on when it comes to something like digital news. We're revising our collection guidelines accordingly, and we're informing a newspaper strategy. So this has been an exciting um, opportunity, and it allowed us to tell our preservation colleagues, well, if we're able to go where we want to go and acquire perhaps 50 uh, medium-sized dailies across the country, we're going to need two terabytes annually. Having acquisitions people be able to provide that kind of information to our preservation colleagues, I think, is one of the first steps. Um, I'll say it just a few quick words. I know there's lots of folks in the room that are interested in um, uh, the electronic feces harvesting. And I have to say, I was a bit encouraged to hear Jeff talk earlier about sharing our struggles <laughs> as well as our successes. 
Um, so LEC has been um, acquiring digital theses, as many of you know, since 2014. And uh, by the time 2016 rolled around, there were challenges. Our in-house uh, tool was no longer functioning properly. It had introduced um, security and technological challenges that made it no longer tenable and forced us to take a look at looking at alternatives. But not all digital ingest pilots are smooth and they're not all success stories. So after exploring an open source tool and realizing and learning the hard way that it wasn't working the way that it, our, we needed and that our clients needed, um, we have now got a, uh, a new way forward. Like it's again using the digital asset management system that, uh, that we've um, talked about and we have a long-term solution now for the Theses Canada program. And I'm really happy to report that the testing is so promising and it's well underway. We are currently working with 25 universities. Some of you perhaps have already had your calls from Arlene Wetter, our thesis librarian, and uh, we're looking forward to resuming those harvesting activities in the spring. Um, where am I going here? Okay, so the third, um, the third pilot that we've done is we've tried to focus on targeted outreach to the creators of digital, um, digital publications and musicians. And uh, it, when we're seeking to increase our digital acquisitions, we need to reach out to these content creators because some of them have different needs. They have different opinions. One component of LAC's new publisher's outreach strategy really focuses on this notion to deepen relationships and increase our own understanding of how digital content is created in the industry. It will ultimately help us fill gaps. And we have been, I have been be really benefited by, you know, meeting with folks like the guy in the picture there who was telling me in no uncertain terms that we need to change in order to acquire digital music. We have to look at things like acquiring individual songs, not albums, that the term album is old news. Like there's some interesting things that we need to learn from the creators of digital content. So just a final word on collaboration, so key between acquisitions and preservations, um, professionals, of course, the partnerships between universities, governments, and more and more private sector uh, partnerships, I think, are something that we would like to explore. And the content creators being in the middle of all of that. So that's just a little bit of a glimpse of how acquisitions at LEC is trying to um, move into the digital preservation space by acquiring digital material. Thanks so much, Karen, and you've provided a lovely segue to, um, <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. I know um, the challenges that Annie Murray at the University of Calgary is tackling right now, she might not think that albums are old news, and I think we're going to hear about <laughs> her new news here. Um, I'd like to next introduce Annie Murray, Associate University Librarian for Archives and Special Collections at the U University of Calgary. She'll be talking about, uh, her, the title of her presentation is Rock Music, a Digital Preservation Gateway Drug. Okay, this is the lightning-like story of an archive that has been a catalyst for some fairly significant um, curatorial and preservation developments in Calgary. Uh, in 2016, we announced that we had begun to acquire the archive of Capitol Records Canada and EMI Music Canada. And by the end of that year, we had begun a project with the support of Andrew Mellon Foundation to investigate methods to preserve the audiovisual components of this archive. And then we received further funding from Mellon to keep going with mass migration of the audio and a portion of the video. Until this point, digitization projects in Calgary had been primarily imaging projects for archival and special collections material, often approached one grant funded effort at a time. Well, this is not that different, but gradually uh, digital collections had been consolidated into a mostly common look and feel content DM instance. Um, theses and other institutional outputs went into the DSpace repository. Assets were stored on servers with appropriate backup strategies, but we were not practicing really formal or comprehensive activities around preserving the assets. Um, EMI changed all of that. While several of our staff had been working towards more formalized approaches to managing digital content, we lacked a preservation strategy and didn't have a digital asset management system or preservation strategy. Um, various staff had attended training on digital preservation, but like many institutions, allocating resources toward dedicated systems or staffing hadn't taken place yet. 
The sheer number and size of the files we knew we would be generating from 40,000 audiovisual recordings allowed us or forced us to begin to seriously reconsider our storage and asset management infrastructure. We obtained the services of AV Preserve to help guide us through some of our challenges and to assist us in formulating our requirements to manage such a large and unique archive of pop music related recordings. So while pop and rock music are ubiquitous, the carriers of the master recordings are not, and much of 20th century music is stored on vulnerable magnetic, optical, or digital uh, carriers. So this archive has required significant investment in facilities, staff, and expertise. <clears throat> so, and this is not to denigrate any previous digitization efforts at all, but with, with, the, the ac with the emphasis being on providing for access, it's like, here's your content, digitize it, show it off, and now trying to mature the approach a bit. So for facilities, we set up a makeshift migration studio in the Taylor Family Digital Library, while a new dedicated AV preservation space was being built in an extension to our high density uh, preservation facility. We also obtained a cold storage room for long-term storage of our media holdings. We invested in two Dell PowerEdge servers with 500 terabytes of storage to be able to manage the initial 300 terabytes we plan to generate before the end of 2020. We prepared and issued an RFP for a dam and we're currently at the vendor demo stage. We developed a lot of workflows to migrate recordings in numerous formats and then workflows for imaging all kinds of carriers and containers. So our archival information packages will consist of the descriptive information for each recording, the recording itself, and then the high res images. While we haven't selected the dam yet, the scale of this migration project has enabled us to envision a more consolidated approach to asset management. So while we may have wished for these elements to come together sooner, they are coming together now. And we have pop and rock music to thank for making us getting real and serious about digital preservation at the University of Calgary. You're welcome, we are preserving Glass Tiger. Um, and I will say that my role in this is curatorial primarily, so I'm sort of the, the loud client who needs these services rather than the, person, the skillful person who's implementing them. Thank you. Bonjour tout le monde, bon après-midi. Uh, yeah, go, uh, I'll, I'll introduce you. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> moving on from music to architecture, which I think has been termed frozen music at various terms of time. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Mireille Annaper from Digital, uh, she's Digital Archivist at the Canadian Centre for Architecture. Um, and her uh, presentation is entitled Preserving Software for Long-Term Access to uh, CAD Files. Oui, alors, euh, bon après-midi tout le monde. J'espère que vous m'entendez bien. Euh, donc, c'est ça. Le Centre canadien d'architecture acquiert depuis plus de dix ans euh, des différents des, euh, des documents nés numériques, euh, mais qui sont disséminés un peu partout dans ses collections. Avec la série d'expositions archéologie du numérique, ils se sont mis à acquérir de manière intensive plus d'une vingtaine de fonds d'archives au, au format principalement numérique. Donc, ça l'a amené euh, fort heureusement, euh, entre autres avec la collaboration de témoins chez Justi, donc la mise en place d'un programme de procédure et d'outils euh, pour procéder au traitement de ces archives, qui, qui sont quand même complexes, et ainsi qu'à leur préservation à long terme. Euh, donc, aujourd'hui, je vais vous parler un peu des euh, les logiciels, parce que, euh, justement, on veut pouvoir accéder à ces documents-là à long terme, on veut pouvoir les consulter, et il euh, y a un gros problème avec les logiciels de cas, les logiciels de dessin assisté par ordinateur, c'est qu'il y a une énorme variété dans les années 90, une grande quantité aussi de versions différentes, euh, donc il n'y a pas de solution vraiment euh, at large pour euh, tout transposer en, dans un format euh, actuel et euh, s'assurer d'avoir accès à tout. On veut aussi être en mesure d'accéder aux données d'origine telles que conçues par l'architecte, le, le dessinateur, parce que c'est avec ça qu'on peut voir c'est quoi son processus de travail. Euh, donc, on, on a tout ce pan-là. Et il y a aussi le côté bon de préserver des logiciels, parce qu'il y a aussi un volet historique dans l'évolution des outils, justement, de dessin cité par ordinateur, qui peut être intéressant aussi pour les chercheurs. Ça fonctionne. Euh, donc, c'est ça. On a eu la chance quand même au CCA d'avoir des ententes avec certains fournisseurs pour des versions de logiciels plus récentes. Euh, oui, 
c'est bon. Euh, puis, euh, sinon... Ah oui, excusez-moi, je sais être sûre. Euh, donc, c'est ça. Par contre, pour une certaine balance, on a eu la chance aussi d'avoir un, un partenariat avec l'American Institute for Architects qui nous donne accès à une collection, une large collection de logiciels qui date des années 90 et du début des années 2000. Donc, on procède à une capture de ces logiciels qui sont surtout sur des supports, euh, euh, des disquettes 3.5 pouces et 5, 5 pouces et quart. On utilise, on a la chance d'utiliser un contrôleur qui s'appelle Cryoflux qui permet donc euh, d'ajuster, de, de, d'ajuster en fait la lecture des, des disquettes euh, selon leur type de formatage. Et euh, on procède à tout ça dans un environnement BitCurator. Euh, on procède aussi à la documentation de, des logiciels, donc comment ils fonctionnent, comment ils doivent être configurés, euh, c'est quoi leur licence. Euh, donc, et on inclut tout ça, donc on ramasse un maximum de métadonnées que, dans lesquelles, qu'on met dans notre système, dans notre base de données euh, de traitement. Et, <rire> et, euh, et c'est ça, donc on procède en fait, on inclut donc les images disques, la documentation dans les paquets CIP qu'on met dans Archivematica pour la préservation à long terme et la réutilisation. Euh, à noter qu'on procède à une pour la stratégie de préservation de ces logiciels-là, on est au niveau des bits, euh, donc on s'assure euh, en, de, de la fixité des empreintes des, ou des checksums sur une base régulière. Euh, donc, qu'est-ce qu'on aimerait faire dans le futur pour euh, réutiliser tous ces beaux logiciels qu'on capture? Donc, le, l'idée, ça va être d'avoir des, euh, des machines virtuelles où on va configurer euh, les systèmes d'opération avec les logiciels pour pouvoir donner accès aux chercheurs aux différents fichiers dans leur dans leur euh, contexte d'origine. Euh, on regarde aussi de très, 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 très près euh, les, euh, l'évolution des travaux de Emulation as a Service Infrastructure de l'Université Yale, qui est un projet euh, qui va permettre de constituer des bibliothèques, euh, donc de systèmes d'opération avec des logiciels. Euh, donc, ils en sont un peu à une phase bêta, mais euh, je vous invite fortement à voir euh, leur progression aussi. Euh, voilà, je pense que j'ai manqué un petit bout, c'est ça. Et euh, aussi, c'est ça, un des autres éléments, en fait, aussi, qui est très euh, délicat, euh, c'est tout ce qui est licence et droit d'auteur par rapport au logiciel, qui est un des gros problèmes. Euh, il y a quelques semaines, l'association euh, des Research Libraries, donc le, la maison mère, euh, si on veut, a publié un guide des meilleures pratiques que je vous invite à consulter, donc euh, qui est guidé effectivement sur des bases légales plus américaines que canadiennes, euh, mais qui indique... Euh, c'est ça, les meilleures pratiques pour faire une utilisation selon l'usage équitable, le, fair, le concept du fair dealing. Um, et il y a tout juste deux semaines, euh, donc la Library of Congress a euh, émis un décret euh, qui permet de contourner euh, les, euh, les moyens technologiques euh, de gestion des, de la protection des droits d'auteur pour des fins de préservation des logiciels. Donc, c'est une grosse percée aux États-Unis par rapport à ça, qui pourrait peut-être aussi être une inspiration euh, au niveau canadien. Et euh, donc, je conclue. Euh, allez voir, euh, oui, allez voir, il y a beaucoup de projets, il y a une grande communauté autour de la préservation des logiciels, que ce soit pour les logiciels de jeux vidéo, euh, le Internet Archive qui fait juste un gros ramassage at large et euh, de tout ça. Et euh, j'aimerais aussi vous dire que le 18 janvier, donc marquez la date, nous aurons une petite conférence au Centre canadien d'architecture pour vous parler de nos méthodes de travail, nos workflows et comment on utilise nos outils sur beaucoup plus que juste la préservation des logiciels. Merci. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, well, you're also well behaved. Thank you so much for getting through your your presentations, the appointed time compared to the last panel. Um, uh, next, we have um, a, a, a colleague. A, Personal, uh, Umar and I work a lot together uh, within the global context, so it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Umar Kassim, Digital Preservation Officer at the University of Alberta Libraries. His um, presentation is entitled Portage's Federated Approach to Preservation um, to Preserve uh, Canadian Research Data. Thank you, Umar. Thank you, Corey. Um, so today I'm going to talk about an initiative you probably, most of you are aware of, Portage. Uh, Basically, it's an initiative from CARL, and Portage is dedicated to the shared stewardship of uh, research data in Canada. Uh, within Canada, as, as we all know, the, the, the top-down approach to managing research data is 
is still uh, missing or in the process. So the car libraries are working together to come up with a bottom-up approach where we all can work together in order to maintain and, and preserve the research data. So first of all, maybe by now you all have memorized the definition of digital preservation, so I do not need to go through it again. Uh, so it's, it's an active management of uh, content over the, ter over the long term. And as Steve put it earlier correctly, that it's not that you put it once and then you forget it. It's, it's the continuous struggle to make it and to maintain it. And, and one of the other, can say, interesting challenges that there is no feedback. And that's why people say that most of the digital preservation people are pessimists. They are always thinking negatively, this will disappear and this will happen to this much because there is no feedback. So you, you don't know whether things, we all are sitting here 50 years from now, likely no one of us will be working in this area. So how do we, in this uncharted territory, what should we do? So Portage has a number of expert groups. Uh, one of its expert group, which I'm chairing, is the preservation expert group. And our task is basically to come up with recommendations, come up with strategies, how can Portage work in this area? How can it work to preserve the Canadian research data for the long-term access? So two things that we felt in our group, in our expert, expert group, or for any academic person, important two things is how to ground it into a theory which is already proven to be working. And secondly, to follow what others have been doing or are successfully doing it. So we followed that guidelines. And first of all, we looked for all those frameworks, all those, all those grounded theories which are currently working or which have successfully been uh, deployed. So one of those frameworks, which probably all of us are aware of, is OIS, which has been successfully used for the last so many years. And NASA was the first one to basically establish that. So in, in that, it's... Okay, sorry. It it provide it it has guided many organizations. Secondly, it is discipline independent, and thirdly, it provides a common vocabulary to talk to each other around that. So, what in, we have recently published a white paper providing all those guidelines. How what are the directions that Portal should take in order to preserve uh, the Canadian research data? So, we have taken the OIS model. There are six functional entities within OIS model. So we've taken apart those six entities and we have seen how can we provide these six functions through Portage. And three of those functions are repository service related, which Portage is already providing through FRDR and Dataverse North. So access, ingest, and data management. These functional entities already are being addressed. The two remaining preservation services and planning and monitoring are the ones which we have to tackle in the next uh, little while. So in preservation services, it's mostly about uh, preservation processing and as well as archival storage and in planning and monitoring, basically overviewing all the things that are happening within uh, the preservation of research data. I'm running out of time. So uh, one is we have grounded this into the OIS model. And second, looking around the globe, are other people doing something similar? So what we have seen is re uh, Corey and I were at, uh, at a conference and we met with folks at, in UK and in Australia, and they are doing quite similar thing. It wasn't a surprise to us because we were thinking we are using this model. So UK's just... Uh, JISC has this UK Research Data Shared Service, which is very similar to what we are proposing that Portage should do. And uh, the Australian National Data Service is also provided, providing a similar uh, approach. So as a next step, basically, we um, have a plan to, in the next two years, we have sketched a, 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 
a plan what to do in the next two years. First, building a common understanding of basic digital preservation requirement. Our hope is to come up with a working group with higher level managers within, within university administrators who can, who can sit together and who can provide us the guidelines around, come up with consensus around the requirements. Once we have those requirements, then we focus on partnerships and working on basically coming up with agreements and, and how different organizations can work together in preserving because preservation costs a lot as compared to if you are just talking about access, which is shorter term. So who, who will be paying, how this will happen? And then unifying messages not only car libraries, but Compute Canada, RDC, and all those bigger players who are in the room for digital preservation, how we can unify the messaging so that any funding that come which support a similar, we, we, we travel on the same, same route in the direction. And lastly, uh, not least, the articulating the core competency, providing training and guidance to all those who are newer in this field, so that we all can come together to uh, to basically travel through the, this difficult and and very challenging journey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Omar. Thank you. Um, next up, we have uh, Tim Walsh, a digital preservation librarian at Concordia University Library. His talk is entitled "Bulk Reviewer: A Software Application for Managing Sensitive Information." in digital archives. Tim, over to you. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna talk today about Bulk Reviewer, as Corey said, um, an ongoing project that I started this summer as a fellow at the Library Innovation Lab at Harvard Law School. Um, <clears throat> the idea for Bulk Reviewer came from my own experiences implementing digital preservation workflows at the CCA with Mire and others as well as conversation um, in particular at the 2017 BitCurator Users Forum um, in Chicago, where it became apparent um, to both me and many others in the room um, that we had a common gap in our processing and access workflows relating to the discovery and management of personally identifiable information, or PII, and other types of sensitive information in digital archives. Um, there's many types of sensitive information that might be present in faculty papers, business records, research data, and other types of assets in our care. And some of these, like national identifiers, um, that's not a typo for social security numbers, by the way, which I'll get to in a minute, um, credit card numbers, phone numbers, email addresses, we're used to thinking about these things as potentially problematic. Um, but there are others, like internet history and GPS data, um, which uh, are perhaps less obvious, but also important, especially as more and more computing and communication happens on mobile devices and as data from those devices begins to enter cultural heritage in in institutions. Um, so in addition to any legal requirements that they must follow, libraries and archives have a responsibility to conduct good faith screenings for such information, um, but there presently exists little consensus for what constitutes a good enough screening. Um, in practice, um, and this is pretty well documented, um, this means that the presence or even potential presence of sensitive information in digital archives can have a freezing effect, keeping collections essentially in our backlogs and out of our users' hands. Um, this is in part because identifying such information can be difficult since most digital archives are messy unstructured data encoded in a wide range of often obsolete file formats. Um, however, it's also, and maybe primarily, because the existing tools in this domain, things like Bulk Extractor and Forensics Toolkit, um, are actually designed for police and forensics investigators, not for librarians and archivists, and they don't actually satisfy our list of user requirements. Um, for instance, these tools can be very effective at finding sensitive information, um, but don't include functionality typically for then taking action on the offending data so that the broader set of files can be shared with our end users. Um, so this summer, with 11 weeks of dedicated time due to the generous support of the Library Innovation Lab, um, I began building a free and open source software application to try to fill the gap. Um, so between June and August, I created a functional prototype of Bulk Reviewer um, using technologies like Django and Vue.js. Um, and this prototype allows users to scan a directory or disk image for various types of sensitive information, um, and then review the results, generate out reports, um, and create file exports, which separate out problematic files which might need to be run through, say, redaction software like Acrobat from those that are free of, of problems. Um, and here you can see a screenshot for the current browser application, um, as well as a small screenshot from the GitHub repository, 
um, showing the many open issues representing um, hundreds of hours of development work still to be done. Um, and I'm currently in the process of planning this work and in the meantime, continue to sort of make improvements on the prototype. Um, but talking about the development roadmap, um, uh, this is essentially the plan. Um, first, I want to get Bulk Reviewer to a stable release that can be shared, tested, and put into use by libraries and archives doing digital preservation. Um, so this work to get it there um, includes improvements to the scalability, security, and user experience, um, as well as expanding the types of information being looked for, improving the quality of results by routinely OCRing files prior to starting the scan for sensitive information, um, and making Bulk Reviewer fit for a Canadian context um, by adding scanners for social insurance numbers, adding translations, and improving the quality of results for non-English source files. Um, most of the existing open source software utilities, many of which Bulk Reviewer uses under the hood, uh, they essentially all come from the United States. So they have a very Anglo and very American focus that we need to actually put resources into changing. Um, then at a second stage, um, I'd like to experiment with adding a machine learning layer to Bulk Reviewer. Um, with the attention of making the results more context aware, um, reducing the number of false positives and prioritizing likelihoods by their risk for the human that's sitting down and actually doing the work with this tool. Um, this isn't without its difficulties, uh, including finding or creating representative test data to train a machine learning algorithm. So I look forward to going to the IRB with that one. Um, but it promises to greatly increase the quality of the resulting product and might be an interesting case study for AI technology in libraries in a sort of practical, less type up way um, something like what EPAD has done for, for email um, by at Stanford University Libraries. Um, all of my work on this project is free and open source and available on GitHub, um, so please check it out. Um, if you have any ideas or questions, I'm always interested in hearing them. Um, I'm also very interested if anyone um, has a stake in this, has strong opinions, would want to do user testing at some point, or has a, a would want to collaborate on development. Um, I'm all ears, so... Uh, I'd, be happy to talk with anyone today or uh, anytime by email or Twitter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, our, our last, um, our last uh, lightning talk before we enter a um, uh, period of discussion is from uh, Jess White, who is digital asset librarian at the University of Toronto. And she will be talking about floppy capture Dot .py, automating forensic disk imaging for accuracy, efficiency, and data reuse. Over to you, Jess. Yeah. Can I go to slide one? Thanks. Uh, OK. Uh, so today, I'm just going to talk about a small automation script that I wrote to fix what was, to me, actually a pretty big problem. So some context uh, about me. Uh, I don't like doing things twice, and I really appreciate consistency. So <laughs> when the, the problem I'm about to describe might not seem like a big problem to you, but it felt like a big problem to me. Uh, OK, so what was the problem? Uh, first part is we have floppy disks. They're in general collections, special collections. They're everywhere. And as I'm sure you all know, they're not the best storage medium. So uh, I image them or a student images them. Uh, that is, I take an exact sector by sector, bit by bit copy or image of those disks. And that way, when they eventually fail, we still have the content. And when I do that work or a student does that work, uh, we want the output to include a log of the process, what we did, metadata about the thing we just did, um, or the object we created, the disk image itself, uh, a photograph of the disk because that's handy, and though not always the case, uh, extracted logical files. And that makes up a nice little output package. And then, of course, separate from that, a work log. Uh, you know, so if, for example, if we're doing a series of disks for the law library, we can hand back to them a work log. Here's everything that we did, here's what we failed at, you know, so on. Um, so to do all that, I or some students use this little rig setup. And she's gorgeous. Uh, and that seems great, right? So what's the problem? Well, this is the problem. There is too much typing. That's, <laughs> that's my big problem. Too much typing and too much time and too much redundancy. So if I use all these separate GUI tools that are up here to make all the things that comprise our desired output, uh, I or a student ends up entering the same data over and over and over again. Uh, you know, let's say you want to ID every disk with its call number and you've got to create name text directories, you know, the disk image, the photo, you've got to enter this info in your work log. 
um, put it in your metadata and on and on and on. And I do know about copy and paste. I have heard about it. Um, <laughs> I still think it's a lot of unnecessary keystrokes. But let's say that we have a lot of students working on a project and one of them likes caps and one of them likes lowercase and one of them likes dots and one of them likes dashes and one of them's just known for typos. And one of them just doesn't want to be bound by the conventions of naming conventions. And you know, you get the idea. And also we have the issue over here on the bottom, the metadata. It, where is that coming from and how is it being formatted? Is it a human? I really, really hope not. Um, because most of this is data that we already have. Uh, it's either in our catalog already or it's being generated by these tools and we just have to capture the output. Um, I'd much rather capture it as it goes by rather than try to, I don't know, copy and paste it again. Um, so, what did I do? Da -da -da. Copy capture dot pi. Uh, okay, so I have a video of it running here. Could you press play? Hey, I don't know how visible it is, but I'll just I'll just talk about it and you know. Okay, so to start the script asks the user for basic information about the disk. For example, if it's a three and a half inch floppy or a five and a quarter, the library it's from, and if this is applicable, it's call number or the ID. It then checks the call number. So obviously this is a very environment specific script. You know, you're not gonna be calling the UFT <laughs> catalog, um, but you could adapt it. So it checks the call number and it makes, one, make sure this thing actually exists. Uh, two, it displays the cat record to the user and asks the user, did you really mean this one? And three, it provides an opportunity for the user to check, make sure that nothing's up. So maybe the disk is, you know, cataloged as missing or maybe it's accidentally cataloged as a DVD. Um, it's just sort of uh, quality control. Um, once it's done, it prompts the user to place the disk for a photo, takes the photo, names it, files it away. Then it prompts the user to insert the disk into the drive and creates, so it writes the appropriate command, which can actually be quite a long, complex command, and then runs it to forensically image the disk. And for this, we use a Cryoflux controller card and <coughs> their DTC software. And at the end, it gives the user an opportunity to add a note about anything they want to flag. The other thing it does is before it runs, it checks if that disk has already been successfully imaged. Um, to do this, it checks the work log, but it'll also look in the appropriate directories for existing files. Uh, as you know, there is or can be a lot of duplication in collections. We might have eight copies of the same floppy disk. I don't want that translating to duplication of work. So I've got 30 seconds. Um, oh, uh, what does this mean? Well, this workflow used to take us eight to 10 minutes to run a disk through it. Uh, now it takes about five minutes. Uh, and that's a lot of saved wrists and a lot of saved fingers. And when you times that by 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 disks, that's a lot of time and a lot of money. Uh, okay, uh, thanks. <laughs> well, thank you to all of our, our speakers. The amount of um, energy and work that you represent here uh, on the panel is, is quite humbling, I would say. Um, the, the intention of the session was to leave enough time. We have about uh, 30 minutes, I believe. Jonathan, is, is, yeah, the, the, thank you. Um, to, to just to, to engage with comments and questions for um, for the folks up here on the stage who have been generous enough with their time to share uh, some of the work they've been doing. So I'd like to open it up to the floor for for questions, comments. Yeah. Norman Charbonneau from LAC, to, uh, it's for Sarah. Uh, Sarah, first I want to thank you and your organization because you're the perfect model for all of us who want to work with indigenous people. The way you, the, your processes and the way you apply the, the indigenous protocols are, an were an inspiration for LAC and are still an inspiration for us and thank you for that. And second, since um, working on those topics, with indigenous peoples who suffered so much. Um, what isn't there for you in your, in your work, in your relation with those indigenous people and communi communities? But what isn't there? 
Oops. Sorry, was the question what, what isn't there? What for you? What do you like? What do you oh, what dislike? Do you like? Or, or, because it can be really difficult and emotional. Yeah. It's, it's hard. Um, I would say that the first thing uh, that's not there is um, a stronger presence of Indigenous librarians and archivists in, in the workforce. Uh, I think that um, the opportunity that we have through indigitization to work with uh, aspiring um, community members to become uh, archivists and librarians in their communities without having to go through the, the hoops that we as um, a colonial profession have, have placed in front of people. I think that's really um, one of my favorite things about this work. And um, I really appreciate the opportunity to challenge um, settler colonial assumptions that that all of the content that we're working with is meant to be accessible to everybody all the time. <laughs> um, I fear that in this conversation of, of digital preservation that um, because there are so many systemic barriers for Indigenous communities to be doing this work, that there's a potential risk of being left behind in the digital dust because we can't seem to get our heads wrapped around this one issue of access. We, we have our heads in the sand. Um, digitization funding that gets funneled to projects uh, that privilege Content that can be made accessible means that there is a lot of really valuable material that's not um, getting the attention and carrot that it needs. Um, and I think if we don't take uh, heed of the lessons that we've learned from print uh, and physical archiving over the years, that if, if we're leaving this content in the dust, um, we're going to perpetuate a settler colonial narrative in our digital archives. Thank you. Hi, I have a question for my co-panelist, Tim. Um, I'm really interested in your work because we do a ton of this kind of like manual redaction of stuff at UVic. We have a big um, trans archive among other types of really sensitive information. So um, like how ready for prime time is your application? <laughs> if we download it from GitHub, is there a lot of stuff we'd have to do to kind of localize it or is it something that we could use like pretty easily off the bat? I mean, at this point, it's not ready. Um, it very much was a, it, like, this is a thing, that, it's an obstacle I'd come up against quite a lot and wanted to spend time on, but it was never the priority. So, um, like, the fact that these fellowships exist is amazing because you can go in and really focus on something for a period of time and, and um, talk with new people. You know, I talked with people like a bunch of the Harvard libraries and MIT and other doors that would not have been open to me otherwise. Um, but I spent a lot of that time basically learning what the problem space was by building something. And then I think that's an interesting thing about like starting with a prototype and then trying to make it something real is you often have to walk back on some of that work and be like, oh, I should actually be writing tests before I write code. Um, and so I'm sort of trying to figure out the, the planning for that now, but I think it's very feasible. Um, yeah, I don't have a timeline quite yet. Um, but you can take, uh, so it's all developed in Docker. So if you have a laptop or a desktop or something with enough RAM on it um, to run um, the servers locally, um, you can try it out. Um, it's right now basically intended for like a developer end user. So I think the documentation is probably not there, but I'd be very curious to hear your, uh, your impressions. I, I kind of want to basically ask you the same question, Lisa, um, and say thank you for that work because, holy Moses, man, that's a real issue for us. And, I, and I'm interested, I guess, to ask a useful question, like, have you, what have you seen in terms of your, your interviews or your questionnaire in terms of uh, what, what digital humanities projects that you engaged with uh, have tended to be more ending suitable? Uh, using the approach that you chose? So I think that a lot of the projects that we're actually working with are XML-based projects, so they're already pretty ending suitable to start with. It does make our job a lot easier. There's still some sort of complex stacks on the back end that make that stuff run, and that has to all be taken out of the equation before we archive it, really. We're not looking at emulation as a solution. We're looking at kind of static web pages. So not every project. If your project is to build a tool, 
then you can't do that. The tool has to run as it is. And so that's a different kind of preservation. But I think there are a lot of projects in the DH realm and in other realms that really are just like a backend database of information with a bunch of websites on the front end. And those could be flattened into more static projects for um, preservation. And then they're also, you know, easy to use with web archiving tools and other types of things that don't care for complexity. So um, anything that, that, can easily be written out as a static site is a good candidate. And I think that there is a large chunk of material that's in that category. Things that are intended to be tools, more challenging. And I would say not really within scope of the project that we're doing now. Yeah. Have you considered, um, presumably for those things that are a lot of XML and then they're being migrated to static sites, um, there's a state either at the beginning or sort of when you're halfway to getting into a static site where it would actually be like a nice data set or like a nice like research data set that could live like that too. Have you guys investigated that? One of our principles is to actually take any data sets that could be useful as standalone data sets and make them available alongside the website. So the PIs tend to want the website to be there, right? And a lot of the contributors want the website to be there. But I completely agree that the data set, in terms of being able to like mash it up with other things and reuse it in new ways, it's not really the website that's the useful piece of it. It's what's in the database or it's what's in the XML. So, but you, but you really have to make compromises on that stuff because the researchers care a lot about the look and feel of their sites. And we're like, eh, we're just going to like take all the objects and the metadata because that's what matters. And to them, that's not what matters. The whole site and every decision they made along the way about look and feel matters to them. So to some extent, we're compromising on that because my instinct would be to just take the data and leave the rest of it as well. It's all going to look terrible in 10 years. But, you know, but let's let's pursue this for now and then we'll see. <laughs> I have a, um, a question for the panel to consider and also for everyone in the audience considering the, the day here. Um, we're all doing such a, you know, there, there's a lot of really amazing work happening at the institutional level and at the project level. I'm wondering if, if folks might reflect on what we could be doing at the national level. I mean, selfishly, I'm thinking at the regional level, but at, at the national level to support these kinds of efforts or even just sharing out more of what we do in our individual institutions. Are there any thoughts on what kind of nationally coordinated strategies might resonate with the kind of projects that you're doing? Great question, Corey. Um, <laughs> we, we have Umar down there. Thank you. Uh, one thing I, I would like to add, Corey, is, is it's uh, it's mind-boggling uh, how many initiatives are coming up. Our domain, digital preservation, is relatively new when we compare to mathematics or, or liberal arts or who are there for the last thousands of years. So in digital preservation, which is only a couple of decades old, every day you see tens of emails with new initiatives popping up from here and there and from all across the globe. And you have to then see, okay, which one should we go after? Which one is more appropriate? And, and similar is at our own institutional level. When we see a small challenge, like Jess was talking and she had this challenge and she came up with this solution. And in other places, we also come up with our own type of solutions. I, I still see that it will take time before things get mature. We are still, for the foundation of digital preservation, we are making progress. The foundations are becoming stronger. And now about those leaves and, and branches and those things, I, I believe those will take some time before things will get mature and before the whole community can start adopting those uh, those type of initiative. So I see in particular that if we can come up with a consensus on the foundations of digital preservation, I think we have a good road ahead of us. 
Um, one of the things we can't easily do at our own institution is stuff like geographic replication. So for me, those national networks that have preservation tools built into them, we have storage networks at the university, but they don't have preservation tools. They don't have bit checking. They don't report back to you on things that might be going wrong. Um, so national storage options that I know are going to be really kind of replicated in a variety of places, especially since at UVic, as you know, Corey, we're in a a deathly earthquake zone. Um, so it's not a great place to be the, you know, have the only copy of something. We really want to be able to replicate that stuff. Um, so those like infrastructure for preservation storage with real preservation tools on top of it is something that would be hard for us to do at an institutional level. I think that's really a place that we need to do it like regionally and nationally. Any other questions or thoughts from the, Lise, do you have a, you picked up a microphone. <laughs> what are you doing there? <laughs> Any other uh, questions or comments, uh, considerations from the audience? Okay, um, well, I'd like to thank the panelists once again for sharing, um, and uh, thank you. And I, in turn, will thank Corey and our panelists yet again. Uh, and just let you know, we do have a break uh, timed in right now. Um, and I expect that you'll all be reflecting on that last question we just heard, which is one of the questions on the table discussion um, sheet. Um, there was a sheet placed on your tables this morning with a couple of questions. And we actually have another sheet of questions that were meant for this afternoon. So those will magically appear on your tables uh, during the break. And you're welcome to, you know, I don't think you'll be able to answer all of them, but we look forward to your thoughts on all of them. Uh, please write stuff down. There are some little notepads that the hotel has uh, provided. We also have some larger uh, line drilled paper. If anybody really wants that, I can get you some. Uh, but for now, there's coffee, and I believe there are some snacks outside. Uh, we will come back a little earlier since we're leaving a little earlier. I don't actually know what time it is now. So we could come back at 3. All right, let's come back at 3, and uh, we'll uh, get some table time, and then we're going to have Cliff give us some comments at the end of the day on what he's uh, thought of our various presentations.
कर रहे हो I'd like to invite everybody back to your seats. J'aimerais inviter tout le monde à reprendre vos sièges, s'il vous plaît. The sooner we start, the sooner we end. <laughs> no, I'm not going to start talking. I'm just going to start talking. Okay, so thanks everybody. I hope you all had some coffee and are ready are ready for some discussion. There's been a little change of plan. You remember I told you there were two sheets of paper on your table with discussion questions. There's only one. We decided to give you a much simpler charge. Uh, you'll see on the screen. Uh, we've kind of boiled it all down based on what we've heard today. And so the question now is a two-parter. What do we need to be doing now to address the gaps and build on the successes that we've heard about today? And which organizations do you think are best positioned to advance your suggested next steps? So you're welcome to read the questions that are on the sheet on your table, but uh, we're hoping you can really reflect on this central question that's up on the screen too. Um, and so you've, we're going to give you about 20 minutes to talk at your tables, and I've asked Corey to come up after that and uh, moderate some responses from you. Uh, there is no pressure to absolutely report from every table on every question or on, on the whole question. Uh, and if you migrate to different kinds of questions, that's also okay. Uh, we're totally into iterative thinking here. Uh, so, yeah, uh, 20 minutes starting now. Oh, hold on, a question. So it's just a clarification question. When you say we, um, is we Carl members? Is we research libraries? Is we a broader thing? I would interpret that however you wish, but it could be as broadly as you like. Um, yeah, how's that? <laughs> Any other questions before we get going? All right, thank you. I'll just say one, uh, just one really quick comment, sorry. Um, don't, don't be afraid to think totally outside the box and have fun with these. Um, we'll, we'll have volunteers reporting back, but I may call on you if there's sort of a deathly silence for some of the questions. So, <laughs> so um, and, and just reflect on, on the information that Grant provided this morning in terms of the gaps that were addressed in the survey. It's a good, uh, I'll wander around if folks have questions or anything, thank you.
We're going to get back together as a, as a group in about two minutes here, folks. Thank you. Hi folks, thank you Jonathan for teaching me the spoon trick. All right, everyone, thank you so much. I um, almost um, regret having to, to uh, shut off the conversations. Uh, they seem so involved with really good signs. So we're gonna move now to sort of bring the, the energy that you've had at your uh, individual tables to uh, the, the broader group to discuss these two questions and really anything else you may want to say in this forum that, that has um, special meaning for you. So um, I'll also just say before we get started, if you do have notes, if you've handwritten them, uh, please do feel free to, uh, if you're comfortable with, with leaving those, that this is all being recorded. And so we're able to, um, we're able to capture all of your thoughts uh, in that way too. So nothing will be lost, but if you'd like to share notes, that perhaps uh, have points that don't get shared, please feel free to do that afterwards. So what do we need to do? What do we need to be doing now to address the gaps and build on our successes and which organizations are best positioned to advance your suggested next steps are the two questions that we're going to be tackling collectively right now. Um, so are there any volunteers that would like to speak to the first the first question. <laughs> Umar, yeah. So there's microphones at your table if you'd like to speak into those, uh, just so that we have the for the live stream and for the recording. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. So addressing the gaps, we basically discussed about the gaps that uh, the survey identified and we looked at them in the morning. And based on our discussion, the, the, the core problem that we can see is, is the lack of awareness about digital preservation, about, about the related issues. So basically, um, the prioritization is not to that level. So awareness is not about just knowing about it, but rather admitting that this is something very challenging and then administrators at the higher level of institutions or organization or at the government level, they, re they have this realization that this is a challenge and we need to fix that. So this, this is the big gap that we, uh, we thought is the one. If we can find a solution with that, it will come with money it will come with resources, then those, those administrators will give us resources. And if we look at infrastructure or tools or other uh, things that the gaps are there, around the globe we can see in UK and in Europe and in USA, in general, they, they are a step ahead of, of, of Canada. They have tools and they have um, some solutions that we can learn from. So once we have identified these, uh, this, this ad awareness and advocacy piece and realized our administrators, we probably can um, 
build uh, on top of that. Yeah, folks, jump in. I know it can be it can be intimidating um, to to speak up, but safe space. So I just building on what Umar said, I mean, is if if we're thinking about the second part of the question, what organizations are positioned to do what things where? Um, I, I mean, making the case to administration that digital preservation activities are important. I, this seems like something that Carl could definitely help advocate for since many of our directors come together and meet like it's a forum for them to come together and do some like real talk stuff. I was about to call on you, Claire. Thank you. Uh -huh. Uh, and I'm only speaking because I was the one who agreed to take notes, that's all. Not because I had any good ideas. Um, we talked about the need um, to uh, have uh, some kind of more coordinated efforts. Um, we didn't say how that was going to happen. We just said... <laughs> <laughs> more coordination um, and and the sort of and the notion of identifying who is doing what um, to have an inventory in order to uh, to avoid duplication of effort um, and then we we also mentioned that that we don't talk about what we're working on until we're done so others may not be aware that we're there is an effort already going on to do something um, and then we had quite a good discussion about um, including more community in this conversation and not just limiting it to uh, like the next step would be to, t to take a forum like this beyond mostly academic libraries and to expand out to grassroots communities where institution type is not a barrier. And then finally, one last question, how do we expand diversity? That was a question as opposed to how suggesting what we need to do and we said all organizations are best positioned to address this depending on the fit depending on this particular topic or area so uh, at, at our table um we have a two world problem and the, half the tables from carlovia and the other half is at a private institution Canadian Center for Architecture. And so I think to summarize maybe something of what we talked about is that the Venn diagram of organizations with which he interacts sort of maybe doesn't intersect all that much except at days like today. And and also that the, the, one of the examples um, they provided was that um, you, if you knock on the door for for public funding as a private institution, there you, you, you might sort of encounter the attitude of, well, you're private, and you've got your own funds, so so please do it on your own dime. And so that doesn't really put us very well in terms of working working together. So um, towards the end of our conversation, I just this this sort of this half baked idea, um, and it sort of addresses both parts of the question. Is um, we often our our first impulse is often to form an organization to do something. You know, or just create a sub-organization within an organization. And that is often the right thing to do, and it, and it has a lot of strength, and I think we, we know that. It also creates a lot of overhead, and there's a lot of governance. And so one of the suggestions in terms of addressing gaps and building on things is, could we figure out ways to, this is going to sound very heretical, sell things to each other, sell services to each other? Because a financial transaction is easy to, is bridges the gap between sort of different universes better than sometimes organizational structures could because of our funding models, because of provincial boundaries and so forth. Uh, and so if someone's doing something that's really successful, especially if it can be sold in a quantum that can have a price put on it, storage is a really obvious example, but there's other things we do. Would there, would there be any benefit in, to helping us move forward to figuring out how to sell services to each other? Because that's of course what vendors are going to do. And so it's a, a sort of a way to outmaneuver that too. I have, I have a um, comment around that as well. Um, could, could regional and national consortia contribute to that if that was a, a model? I'm not sure if the University of Victoria can sell services. I'm not sure if we can do that to a, a private institution, but perhaps through consortia.
Well, I, I, I mean, I don't. I think I think I think the short answer to your question is yes. They'd probably be better positioned to do it because you can set them so, you can set them up differently. Um, um, and I maybe disagree just because um, I think by nature libraries are not meant set up as things to sell things. Um, and and I understand there's a lot of great logic. I mean, it makes a lot of sense what you're saying, but at the same time, just setting up. We're, so much of what we've talked about today is having difficulty setting up an infrastructure and setting up an infrastructure for selling things. I don't think is a new, t it, I don't think it, it, it's just making another problem <laughs> um, it, or it's re reframing a problem that we already have, I think, from my perspective. All right, thank you for that. Other comments? Okay. Just sit here in uncomfortable silence for a few moments. <laughs> we don't have enough of that in our lives. I mean, we don't need to. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna call on a, a, a number of tables, um, just so that not to, you know, feel free to pass. But um, just because I know that there were some, there were some very good conversations happening, and just encouraging people to share a little bit. Um, so, but do feel free to pass if you'd like to. Uh, but perhaps the this table right here, could you share some of the uh, thoughts you had on? On the first question, bonjour. Avec ce qu'on a entendu aujourd'hui, euh, on constate qu'il y a beaucoup de projets qui sont en cours euh, pour lesquels euh, nous n'avions peut-être pas le maximum d'informations. C'est pas un reproche. Ça fait seulement état qu'on aurait peut-être besoin d'avoir une forme de de recension des projets qui sont en cours euh, dans toutes nos institutions et qui traitent euh, du volet numérique. Quand nous aurons ce portrait, nous pourrons identifier euh, le travail qui nous reste à faire. Et dans le meilleur des mondes, parce qu'on pense qu'il n'y a aucune institution qui est capable de traiter tous ces dossiers, ce serait de voir comment on peut euh, atteindre nos objectifs, combler les lacunes en travaillant et en faisant confiance à plus d'une institution pour traiter, par exemple, de tout ce qui touche les Autochtones, tout ce qui touche la musique, tout ce qui touche peut-être des archives, peut-être pas un seul joueur, là, mais se partager le tout, conserver des données à plusieurs endroits, avoir des copies de sécurité. Comme on disait autour de la table, il va falloir que on développe un intérêt à la confiance de nos partenaires, parce que souvent, on préfère garder par sécurité aussi, par méfiance. Je pense qu'on n'aura pas le choix compte tenu de la quantité phénoménale d'informations. Euh, ça va être difficile de, de rester sur nos modèles actuels. Et compte tenu de cette très grande importance d'information, l'idée de faire des choix qui reste toujours très difficile à faire pour savoir qu'est-ce qui mérite d'être gardé, je pense qu'on n'aura pas le choix éventuellement de faire des choix. Mais qui va déterminer quels sont ces choix? Je ne suis pas capable de répondre à ça <rire> pour le moment, mais je ne vois pas comment autrement. Ben, je dis moi, là... Je ne je sais pas là, si mes collègues partagent complètement ce que je, je dis actuellement, mais je, pour moi, c'est la seule solution de pouvoir éventuellement avoir quelque chose de plus concerté au Canada, au Québec, en français, en anglais. Là, il y a toutes sortes de moyens de regarder le, la situation, mais il va falloir le faire de façon concertée avec le maximum d'institutions si on veut réussir à garder un, un portrait de ce qui se fait actuellement sur le plan numérique, que ce soit en musique, en archives, en publication ou autre. Merci. Um, th that t resonates with me as well. Um, and, and, and I think it's important that you, you talk about more than just collections. It was practices and, and what, we're all, um, what we're all doing throughout the country. One of the... Um, I, I, I have a privilege of facilitating the Canadian Web Archiving Coalition Group, and one of the 
most powerful parts of that group is 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 simply just sharing what we're doing in terms of of um, of collections. And there were there were people that were that were part of um, uh, the collection subgroup that. Um, you know, found out for the first time that Library and Archives Canada or how active B A and Q uh, is in this area as well. Uh, so, so that that sharing is a really powerful thing, uh, and we do, we don't do enough uh, of that as well. So, thank you for your comments. Thank you. Sort of that time of day, you know. <laughs> Why do we leave the? <laughs> let's let's wait until we're tired and low blood sugar to figure out how we're going to solve the problem that we spent all of the, our energy talking about. Um, but that's how we do things. That's how we do things. So, Other, other comments in terms of, um, but perhaps some, I'm not sure if anyone had any, any really good conversations about in organizations. So we have a number of them represented here today. We have regional academic library consortia, we have Portage, we have Carl, we have CRKN. What, did, what were the conversations like around question number two? Um, so I think, I think we've done <clears throat> really well in organizing things regionally in Canada and then um, coordinating across those regions nationally. The problem we have in Canada is that education is provincially funded. We don't have a JISC. We don't have an IMLS that, that's a national organization that we could easily hand this off to. I think there's also a question about what role does digital preservation have in the larger RDM uh, funding, uh, that $572 million pot where there may be a new organization created out of that, does that make sense for uh, the home to be there, perhaps? I don't know. Thank you. Jeff, I'm going to call on you just from... <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the agreements that Portage uh, signed with the regional consortia, can you talk a little bit about how that has um, impacted your work on national infrastructure? Well, I, I fully agree with your assessment of asking these kinds of hard questions at four o'clock on a Friday <laughs> afternoon after five days of travels and meetings, but rising to that challenge. Um, I've been in this position for, um, I guess, 16 months, 18 months, something like that. And in the course of that time, I think the strength of what Portage has done or the, the, good, the good successes of what Portage has done has only been um, strengthened by our relationship with the regional consortia. Um, they bring um, not only the expertise of the people who are who are representing those consortia at the table, and Corey, you are a, a strong person in that in that group, um, but they also bring um, along with them the the voices of the other uh, uh, university institutions who are non-Carl uh, to the table. And for us, that that's made a huge difference. And in practical terms, for us. Um, that has meant going out and talking to some non-Carl institutions and institutions in the environment or in the, in the region of where those non-Carl institu institutions are. And the feedback we get from them and the concerns that they've raised in terms of resources and capacity have informed um, the directions that we're taking when approaching ICED and when approaching the tri-agencies and dealing with the the, the many challenges associated with doing good research data management. So I think the regional consortia have certainly given us a, uh, a broader pan-Canadian view of things. Um, so we just came off a call yesterday um, with at least two out of the four regional consortia available to attend because I think the others were traveling to these events. Um, so yeah, I think it's just it's just strengthening our view of of the national um, national community, at least on the academic side. And I think that we just need to continue to do that. Um, just as an aside, another 
another aspect of this, which uh, the groups represented here today haven't um, en encountered or mentioned, is the colleges, CEGEPs and Polytechniques uh, across the country who are as much under the tri-agency policy as the universities are. And so there's um, considerable interest and considerable concern um, in that community uh, regarding this and their capacity to respond to it. So we're also uh, reaching out to them. Thank you. Annie. Thanks for catching me while I was <laughs> Hi. Um, I was just trying to think about how to put various things together and if only librarians and archivists could find a way to share information quickly with each other. Um, but I, I mean that sincerely because I'm like, I hear about Tim, sorry to use you as an example, but like, what was Tim doing at Harvard? And that sounds really excellent. And he said, I need people to test and be my user community. And so I think that when at a certain university or, or library or archive in this organization develops even workflows, methods that need testing, I think we should be in a better position to rapidly share them and test them more quickly with one another. Um, because it takes so long to develop those things and we need more rapid feedback so that we can adopt them more quickly. So if Jess in Toronto knows everything about floppy disks, thank you because then we will learn from that and maybe we will help you with audio. So like I see these sort of little pockets of expertise developing and we need to understand to really mobilize and share the information more quickly and help each other develop those things and then benefit from what other people have developed. Um, so that's the coffee talking. Uh, and I don't know how to make this happen, but it seems to me that Carl is an appropriate organization for a more rapid dissemination of at least knowing who these people are, what are they working on, and how might they be applicable to your organization. Thank you. Other comments? Jeff. Uh, yeah, I guess just to pick up on some comments that have been made today, um, Annie's being one of them, but um, I mean, it, it's really clear, I think, that we would benefit from more opportunities to gather as community. So that, to me, is really low-hanging fruit, just, you know, being able to have uh, organize, organizations of some sort be able to come together to convene these sorts of events, so whether that's CARL or Library and Archives Canada or BANQ or a combination of all three, possibly others with, uh, you know, if, if we were wanting to look at, uh, at, at other constituencies, that would be, be a good thing to do. But um, yeah, I, I worry a lot that we have this conversation today, a one day event, you know, it's very rich conversation, but that we then go another two or three years before we really convene again in Canada. I mean, some of us might meet up in Washington or, or somewhere in Europe or who knows, but you know, we, we need to have these conversations, I think happening in Canada. Um, when, when, you know, I was just going to mention as well, I think Cliff threw out some very thorny issues for us to think about, but, um, you know, we do have some, I think, some activity happening in the space of preserving digitized items, things that are converted from physical to digital, but we really, I think, as a, a country owe it to ourselves to come to grips with all of the digital production that's happening, the born digital materials, and and try to come up with some strategies that allow us to you know, be a bit more transparent around who's doing what in terms of archiving or attempting to curate archive some of this material and, um, you know, where, where the, the big gaps are that we're, we're missing. And I, you know, I, I'm talking about that quite broadly. I think if we, we really take a step back and look at the full spectrum of materials being produced that we'll see some pretty, pretty enormous gaps. Um, just coming from a small institution um, that nonetheless has nationally important stuff, I just want to express my gratitude that this event is open today, that Carl did something that is not actually just limited to its membership. And I would just say this issue of digital preservation has got a much more diverse texture um, 
there's many dimensions of it that I, I would hate to see limited to um, an association that is, is just research libraries because I think something will be missed there. Uh, yeah, I just thought of something. Um, I don't know if you, uh, well, if there are other Archimedica users in the room, but they've started having some bi-monthly calls, like with a Google Doc, just simple way of sharing and discussing potential developments. So that could also be a type of model to replicate, to have like quick conversation, quick sharing of ideas and projects. Uh, well, of course it needs convener like a Zoom connection or something, but it's rather easy to implement and does not and can be open to whomever and uh, yeah just throwing this out there <laughs> thank you jeff one other thing that came up at our table was the need to develop uh, the human resources uh, necessary on our campuses to respond to the needs of preservation um, and one approach to that we thought of, um, particularly in light of the recent announcement of a SHRC connection grant program for research data management, would be to have something like a data curation network style workshop um, in Canada, um, English, French, <coughs> maybe repeated several places across the country, um, but sort of stepping up to 20,000 feet on that same question. One of the things that I think I'd be concerned about is that much like the RDM funding call that came out from Canaria a while back um, and has recently um, come to fruition, and I don't know if it's announced yet or not, um, is the notion of not uh, duplicating effort and rationalizing somehow um, the kinds of ideas and suggestions going forward from this community so that we don't uh, end up competing against each other and rather we combine forces and have a stronger application rather than having two weaker ones. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there and maybe uh, Carl um, is a, and Portage is a good uh, forum for that kind of uh, collection of ideas and rationalization. Thank you, Jeff. And we're at, uh, we're at, we're at four o'clock. Are there any other um and, and, and any final thoughts before we move to closing? Uh, uh, closing comments from <laughs> Clifford Lynch, I should say. But, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, th thank you so much um, for your for your thoughtful responses. Uh, a lot of this information is going to come back to the digital preservation working group. Um, and I do believe there is going to be a publication um, come out of the day in terms of um, what was discussed and what next steps might look like. So Lee, should I pass it back to you? Thank you very much, everyone. So I'm just gonna take the mic for one second while Cliff comes over. Um, and partly for the people who are leaving, <laughs> just so you know, uh, there will be an evaluation form going out after this event. And there will be an, uh, a notes comment box. So if there are thoughts that come to you as you're heading home or on the plane or who knows, um, you know, sometimes it takes a little while for these thoughts to uh, fully form. Please put them in there and we'll, we'll definitely look at those as well. So we'll consider everything we've heard today, but we will also look for those kind of a few hours later or tomorrow or Monday or whenever you get to filling that out. Though I hope it's no later than Monday. Uh, so on that note, I will pass the mic over to Cliff. Back to you when I'm done. So um, I, I've been asked to uh, kind of, I'm not going to attempt to sum up the meeting. That's um, a little bit more than I can handle. But I have been asked to kind of react and reflect to um, on some of the uh, things that I heard that resonated with me. And um, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to do that in a very kind of uneven basis because um, there were many things I heard that were extremely interesting, but where I don't have a lot to add, there are a couple of places where um, I do have a few things to add or um, a few comments to make. And uh, if um, you did one of the talks that I don't mention, uh, don't feel bad. It's, uh, it's really that you said it all. Um, and I, I don't have anything further to contribute. So, um, 
the survey of digital preservation um, is fascinating, and um, I'd really I, I'd love to see similar surveys for other countries. And I'm really uh, looking forward to um, seeing the final results of that. And uh, I. I wonder if somehow that can't serve as a model perhaps for other people. Um, one of the things I was particularly intrigued about was where that started to look at content, at what kinds of digital materials were flowing in. And it was striking to me that the two top categories, if I read that correctly, were basically personal papers, in other words, special collections material, and organizational and institutional records. Um, both of these are places where you sort of can't avoid the digital because um, those are just the, the nature of those collections, the, those materials are changing and there's just nothing you can do about it. Um, but it was striking to me that those were the two biggest categories. Um, maybe that should tell us something about our priorities. Maybe that should tell us something about where we're not dealing with things. Um, it might be very useful to think about exactly how you're faceting those questions and, and how you're framing them. And particularly if you revisit some of those questions, um, you might think about whether those um, that taxonomy is the right one. Um, off to another topic. Uh, it seemed very clear from the discussions this morning that the whole question of cloud storage and what is it and what to do with it um, and where it's appropriate is very much in the air. And one of the things that's striking to me in listening to these conversations and to many other conversations about cloud storage is that everybody has a different definition of cloud storage. So I think you would be... Um, you would be well advised in advancing and clarifying your work there to come up with some kind of shared taxonomy of different kinds of cloud storage so that you can um, get your categories right. Uh, I would note that there are, I believe, quite similar discussions going on in the states within the National Digital Stewardship Alliance. They have a cloud storage working group. And I honestly, I, I read the minutes of those. I never have time to participate in uh, the calls. Um, and I honestly don't know whether there is some kind of liaison between the work you're doing and the work they're doing. But um, I certainly think that um, if not, that's something to take a take a look at. Um, uh, they, they have already done a good bit of work in this area. Um, somebody spoke about sustainability and the perils of getting grants and using grant funding to uh, advance things. Uh, all I can say there is that that is a lesson that um, we've learned in the States incredibly painfully. Um, uh, grants are wonderful things and terrible things. And um, uh, particularly in the context of um, digital stewardship, they are very problematic because they generally don't lead to sustainable models. The conversation about failures was so important. Um, I can tell you from personal experience that I've been on several um, commissions or committees writing reports, making the case for um, systematic funding for digital stewardship, where the committee has had the obvious good idea of let's document the stakes here. Let's let's um, let's uh, provide some um, boxes or uh, appendices of things that have been lost because of failures to preserve. And it's really hard to come up with. I mean, there are one or two poster children for this, but besides the one or two poster children, it's really hard to come up with these things. Um, now, the story we heard today was of a failure that had a happy ending, but stories about failures that have both happy and unhappy endings are really important here in making the public case for this work.
The survey of digitization work was very interesting to me also. Um, one of the things, though, that that brought home for me was that really digitization is a somewhat different problem than digital stewardship. And while the two are coupled in the sense that the results of digitization flow into the pool of material that requires stewardship, um, the many of the aspects of digitization are very distinctly different than the broader issues of curation and preservation. Um, uh, and it may be helpful to keep them fairly separate. Digitization has different economics. It has different um, funding sources. Skill, different skills are needed. Different motivations are needed. Um, there's a different urgency and a different set of impacts associated with it. Um, in some cases, I think digitization is enormously more amenable to outsourcing or centralization than digital curation activities. For example, I cannot imagine anything sillier than every institution in a country um, developing local expertise and specialized equipment to deal with the menagerie of odd, um, uh, you know, consumer and professional electronic recording devices for various forms of magnetic and optical media that have been popular over the last century. Um, that's that's absolutely crazy. I mean. You outsource that in two or three expert places, and, and the economics are, are much, much better, I think. Um, let me turn to the five-minute talks, the fast talks. Um, those were really fun and really interesting, and um, uh, I, I would like to comment on all of them, but I'm not going to. Um, the Endings Project is really, really important because it gets at what I perceive at least to be a central problem in the emergence of digital humanities and the conversations about the future descendants of the scholarly monograph. There has been shockingly little work on this. Um, in fact, about the only major body of work I know is work that was done at the Digital Humanities Center at the um, at University College London, looking again at the legacy of a decade or so of digital humanities projects that kind of petered out in various ways. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing the final report of that, and I think that um, that will that will be warmly received and hopefully stimulate a good deal more work in this area. Um, I really welcome the discussions about legal deposit in the digital world and about the strategies around outreach to content creators recognizing that content creators are not necessarily always the same people as content owners and content distributors. Um, uh, there are many, many interests in this area. Uh, I think one of the things that we really need to think about um, uh, nationally and internationally as we look at our uh, legal deposit or copyright deposit systems in different countries. And I know that those national um, deposit organizations do talk to each other periodically, is a conversation about how aggressive we need to be here. And um, what are the right kinds of outreach strategies to different interested sectors? I love the discussion on um, the CAD files and the problem there. This is a beautiful example of a, in some sense, niche, but simultaneously exceedingly important area where there is a body of pra digital practice. And um, this is one that I know a few institutions have looked at besides um, uh, CCA. I know MIT did some work in this area a few years ago, for example. Um, but uh, I think trying to identify 
more of these niche areas sooner rather than later is exceedingly important. I also want to underscore the reference that that presentation made to ARL's recently um, published uh, Code of Best Practice in Software Preservation. Um, there was a lot of uh, work and consensus behind that. And I'm, I, I think that um, that's being very well received by the, um, by the, um, community of memory institutions. If you've not seen it, it's well worth a look at. Um, finally, among the uh, fast talks, I would say the um, bulk reviewer one raised interesting questions to me. I've seen a very small number of these kinds of experiments in using um, various forms of machine learning and natural language processing to handle collection filtering and redaction. Um, now, I think that um, we really need to kind of take a deep breath and frame this, this work more as a sort of strategic research initiative for this reason. Um, if you look at the amount of material that's coming on in digital form that needs this kind of processing, whether it's human or machine, um, it's very clear that one of two things are going to happen. Either our backlogs are going to approach infinity, and in due course, we're going to say, well, it makes no sense to create ever-growing backlogs that we'll never be able to process. So what we need to do is massively scale back our ambitions about our ability to preserve the cultural record. Or we need to develop tools that can deal with this at scale and make the commitment to go down that path. Now, going down that path to me means a couple of things. It means trying, it means recognizing that what humans do isn't perfect right now by any means. It means trying to characterize how well do humans do in practice and then comparing that to how well the machine systems do. It would also be a good idea to understand where the humans tend to fail and where the machines tend to fail and whether they fail in the same or very different ways. Once we get some of that data, it's time to have a conversation about risk and what constitutes acceptable risk and best practices around risk for different classes of collections. Um, we do that calculus now. We just don't talk about it and we're not explicit about it. But curators, archivists, managers of special collections are doing those kinds of calculations now. If we're going to step up to the digital world at scale, we need to get explicit about that. And this is something that I think really needs to be pursued on both a national and international basis. Finally, while I had very little time to reflect on the last conversation, there was one piece that struck me as exceedingly important, and I just want to get out my underliner. The conversations between Carl and non-Carl institutions in the context of funder mandates. In many of our countries, including the United States, and I believe including here, there are people who get grants from the research funders that are not in our leading research institutions. Those people are nonetheless subject to the same conditions and mandates from the funders that the folks at our leading research institutions are. However, those, in, those people do not have institutions with the technical capabilities and the economies of scale to meet those mandates. Somehow we have to come up with networks, models, service offerings, some set of creative solutions to bring those people along. And we're struggling with this in the States now. And it sounds like you're struggling with this too. 
And I just say, don't overlook this. It's very easy to have a self-reflective kind of internal conversation among the leading Carl institutions about, well, gee, we all share this problem at considerable scale. How are we going to share expertise among us or deal with it? But the problem is really bigger than that. And it requires, I believe, a perspective that's bigger than that. So those are a few reflections and places where um, the discussions today really resonated with me. I can't say how much I really enjoyed being here and listening to where the thinking is here and all of the good work that's going on here. And thank you again for having me. With that, I'll turn this back over to you. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Cliff. We're really lucky to have you here with us today. And uh, I really appreciated all your reactions and, and the fact that you brought us back to risk uh, in our title at Risk North too. So that was a nice touch there. I don't know if that was on purpose. Um, so as we bring today's open forum to a close, I'd like to once again thank all the speakers who uh, very generously shared their experience with us today. I'd also like to extend thanks to everyone who's here today. Um, and I really look forward to your continued contributions because this conversation obviously needs to continue. I think that came across loud and clear. Um, I did mention the evaluation form, so please use it. Please give us your comments. We're looking forward to them. And I, I will reiterate that we are planning a summary report um, of today's uh, comments and uh, findings and et cetera. Uh, so there'll be key points, arguments raised throughout the day, and we will ask for reactions to that because I think that'll be an important part to uh, hear how people uh, reflect on that. Uh, also, the Digital Preservation Working Group is going to continue its work, and we'll be using today's outcomes to define our next activities. So th these will certainly be designed to respond to existing gaps in Canada's digital preservation capacity and collaboration, I think. Uh, I'd also like to wish uh, or thank once more our very uh, wonderful co-presenting organizations that we had on screen earlier, but uh, the Canadian Research Knowledge Network, Library and Archives Canada, and Bibliothèque et Archives Nationales du Québec. Just two more lines. <laughs> I would like to thank the members of the Digital Preservation Working Group who have been great to work with, and in particular those who uh, helped prepare for this event. I will thank Jonathan, even though he's not here. Um, but uh, it's been a really fun event to prepare and to work on. And I hope you've all enjoyed it. And uh, I'm glad to say we're done a little bit early. So uh, <laughs> without uh, any further ado, I wish you all an excellent weekend. Bonne fin de semaine à tous et merci beaucoup d'être venus.